All right. Cool. So today we're doing events. Oh, I'm, I'm not sharing screen, am I? Tiny screen. This one. I think. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Events. The events, yes. Very intriguing. <laughs> what makes the websites dynamic? Do you before Ricardo comes back, do you are you familiar with callbacks at all? Sorry, the line was cutting a bit. I didn't hear what you said. Are you are you familiar with call Callbox, sorry. Callbox. Uh, Callbox, yeah, for functions. I, I'm not. So when you, you, you know, when you do uh, something. Call, callback. Yeah. yeah. Callback. Yes, yes, yeah. I hear cold box, like a cold box. Oh, no, sorry. Callbox. Something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And any, do you have a lot of information about like asynchronousness and things like that? No. Um, no. I kind of know what asynchronous versus synchronous is. That it has to do with when it's asynchronous, it doesn't wait. Um, it has to do with waiting or not waiting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah, we can touch on that a little bit. Hi, Ricardo. I think. Set up. Cool. Let me just do this. Cool. All right. Is Ricardo here or not? Can we start? Ricardo, you are mute if you're trying to talk. Okay, let's give him a minute. <coughs> yes, yeah, so we, we started doing DOMs and. Yeah kind of mixing a bit of JavaScript and CSS. Yes. How do you find that? I mean, me personally, I, I've found, I mean, I think I need a bit of time to adjust. Mm. I find it fascinating, but a bit difficult to assimilate, if I may say. <laughs> what, do you, what do you feel more excited about, just JavaScript or, or web pages? Um, both. I mean, I, I quite like the programming aspect of JavaScript, but I mm. quite like the kind of formatting aspect of the of, of CSS. So I quite enjoyed being able to see on console log yeah. the reason happening on, on the screen rather than on, on the code, like on the terminal. terminal. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess at some point you're going to have to, you guys are going to have to decide what you want to be, you know. I mean, obviously you can be full stack developers as well, but I wouldn't recommend that at the beginning. So you're gonna kind of have to decide: Do you want to go back end way or do you want to go the front end way? Really? All right. Is that really so? Like you can't be both. Like I'm, I'm just. I mean, I'm doing this more as a, as a hobby, as a, for fun. But uh, yeah, no, you can be both. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm full stack developer as well, but it does. Um, there's a lot to learn, <laughs> because you know, like you, you need to learn a lot about front end about client and, and browser and, and other clients than just browser. And on the back end there's a lot of other stuff that you need to learn about architecture and databases and, and, and you know queues and I don't know what not. So so there's a lot of stuff to learn basically. So I would not recommend trying to learn everything at the beginning. Um, okay, but got it. to be honest, these days, like you know when you you will definitely start doing React at some point because React is just the thing right now. Um, it's a, it's a frame. Well, it's not a framework. It's a library for for JavaScript, and almost everybody is using it. And it's kind of the whole thing is kind of shifting towards uh, server rendering. So basically, what it means is while you're working on your application, you're doing both. You're doing your front end and your back end. But the back end is quite limited. I mean, you can go as far as you want, but like from out of the box, it's quite limited just to kind of satisfy the needs for the front end. So so you will probably touch on both anyway. Uh, these days, that's what people do. Is it you know, is it better or worse? That's up to discussion, but <laughs> but you know, it has some upsides and downsides, really. But when, when you get like a, let's say a freelance job, uh, is it usually saying, oh, uh, you need to do something front end or you need to do something back end, or is it? Uh... Uh, usually, usually it does say, but 
it's not always true, right? So, you know, especially, so I'm, I'm, I'm not doing freelance, I'm doing contracts, like longer, like, like a six months or whatever contracts for different companies. So they actually know what they want. But if you do like a true freelance, then, you know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, I need something to do on the front end and I need it to be able to like, you know, register users, for example. And obviously registering users, is not front end. Front end is the form but the actual writing users in the database so you can preserve it and stuff like that is is a backend so so basically what you what they need is like a full blown application front end to backend so there's a lot of people who will tell you something but you need to have a look at it and kind of you know see kind of you know analyze what what actually they need because a lot of people just don't know what they need they know what the end product should be but they don't understand what is involved right it's one of the joys of being a developer dealing with non-technical people. It's lovely. I was when I was when I started when, uh, right after school. I was kind of like an IT support, and I was working in one school for for a while, and I was just kind of taking care of the networks and stuff. And there was this teacher who kept calling me into her office, and she said, "My computer is not starting. My computer is not starting." You know, this is all days where you know there were some things why a computer wouldn't start, and basically she. So what she was doing was, she, as she was working, she was kicking the keyboard off the, off the uh, computer. So in the old days, when your keyboard was not connected to the computer, the computer wouldn't start. It would just tell you, I don't have an interface to start. <laughs> so so every, time she, every time she kind of sat with the computer, she kicked it off from the, from the, you know, from the, from the port. Oh, it was a nightmare. Like, dealing with these people was just something. Yeah. Printers, oh my god, I hate printers. Anyway, I think we are ready. Uh, Hopefully, Ricardo can hear us. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. I'm yes. here. Perfect. Working from bed today, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Right. So, today we're doing events. Um, <clears throat> you already know about DOM and, and how we render things on the, on the web page. So, now, I, I guess um, up until now, you kind of learned how to render something on the page, but not really how to interact with it. There might be some interaction, but uh, events are really the way to interact. So if you think about it, what events actually are, um, events are listeners on the page where in the sense where basically the, the page is listening for your actions and then depending on your actions, it will do something, whatever you want it to do. And this is called events. So anytime you, for example, you move mouse or if you click or any other kind of interaction, that will raise an event so what we call is raise an event um, and you can whatever listens to that event so you raise the events and you listen to events um, whatever raised whatever listens to that event can react to it somehow so for example if you go on a web page and there is a link and you click on it and it will take you to the next page what it actually means is that you have a you have a static page actually let's have a look at it so you have a static page I think this kind of syntax should be uh, familiar to you already. Uh, this is just a standard HTML file, and it you know you can see it in here. So now we have links. So if you look at this page, you can all see it, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you look at this page, now it's the static view of the page, but on the background, it's listening for any action that happens, right? So I'm moving my mouse. The browser is doing something. Right now, there is no listener, so it's not really doing anything, but, you know, it, it is listening for it. If I go to the link, and actually, surprisingly, so, even the first thing, look, as I go to the link, the, the kind of cursor of the, of the mouse changes, right, to a, to a little hand with a, with, a, with a finger. So, that already is an event. So, the, the browser knows that you are on top of, that you're pointing to that link. And it does something. So in this case, it actually changes your uh, your the, the the kind of design of the mouse, right? The next event would be when you click on it, and it will take you somewhere else. So it will listen to whenever you click on something, it will listen for it, and it will execute some kind of action. There's a lot of default listeners for for events in the browser. For example, like links. So whenever you put link on a page. By default, the browser will assign a listener to it, 
and when you click on it, it will take you to whatever the uh, href um, references. All right, so, so again, there are many, many, many different listeners on click and on type and on key press and on, on scroll and on, on resize and many, many other listeners. Uh, we're not gonna go through all of them now, but as long as you know, sorry, many other events, as you know that what events are, you can then go to, for example, like MDN, um, uh, and you can probably find all the list of all the events. I'm not sure if it's gonna be here, but yeah. So you see, like these are all the events that you can look. At. I'm gonna scroll really quickly. These are all the events that you can listen to on a page, so you can interact with it somehow. <clears throat> so for you as a developer, it gives you the means to interact with the with the user with the page. Is that is that kind of clear? Yeah. Cool. Let's move on then. Um, as I said, users interact with our pages. Uh, interaction triggers events or raises events, um, and events can trigger functions. So basically, whatever the function is qu quite specific already, but whatever you want uh, events to do, that's what that's what happens when you actually listen to events, right? Uh, terminology: listen for events. That means that you're actually adding to listen to the page to you know, to listen for it. Uh, handle events, that means when you actually whatever executes and events are triggered or fired or raised. There should be. Um, one thing to say before I move on is that you can add listeners to events to pretty much any element on the page. Right. So as I said, browser by default will take any anchor element and add a listener on a click to it and other listeners. You can also add an um, event on a body, event listener, or on or on. Um, well, you don't have any other elements in here now, but if you if you had other other elements, you can or on document actually you can you can add uh, listener as well. So you can either listen for events on the whole page or on a, on a, on a, like a parent um, element or on the final element. It it really is up to you and depending on your um, application what you want to actually achieve. What are possible user inter interactions? This is a kind of subset of what you can actually do. Um, again, you can click, double click, hover, submit form. These are all events, right? Uh, when you change uh, focus with your top key, um, copy pasting is another one that actually is quite useful sometimes, right? Um, orientation change if you have like nowadays you have devices that you can kind of you know rotate and they will change orientation so you can you can change your page or change your interaction depending on what the orientation is um, yeah and all the all the other ones these ones are not as common but still they are there uh, you will find as you go um, as you develop more and more you will find that there are new and new events being added to the browsers and basically, you know, the, the, the documentation for browsers, the APIs that they support constantly changes and you just need to kind of for yourself keep up to date what can you actually interact with. So, for example, uh, you can right now listener for a camera, but, you know, like five years ago, you couldn't actually, you couldn't actually listen for a, for a camera. You couldn't actually get the image from the camera from, from a computer. So they continuously add new um, things to, to browsers to, to be able to listen for them. How do we add event listener? Um, so we is, is a function on element. So element is a basically JavaScript object or, or constructor, whatever you want to call it. And it has add event listener function. You can, oh, sorry, you can, you can call that function and that will basically add a listener to it. So as you can see in here, first argument is the actual event that you want to look uh, that you want to listen for, and the second argument is the callback. Uh, you told me you know callbacks already, right? So it's the callback. What's going to happen uh, when that event actually is triggered or raised? So let's try that in here. We have our link, and if I say actually let me check. oh no, let's just leave it. And if I say in my in here, I'll do we will, so when you adding. Uh, listeners, you need to be able to target it somehow, that element, right? So say that we add ID in here, just for the simplicity. 
So hello world is our ID of this element. Do you know what IDs and classes are? Yes. Yes, cool. So you add ID to this to this element and then you can tag it in here. So you can say um, we will first find it on the page. This is how you will find it, and then we will say anchor at event listener. Click, and then whatever you want to execute. Okay. I think I have to do this. Or actually, let's do this. As the um, a uh, href, you know, like um, yes, href is it is it an uh, event listener in itself or not really? Href is a an attribute. Oh, okay. Okay. So actually, we can we can recreate this. Maybe it will make more sense. So let me just show you one thing, and then we can try to oh sorry, then we can try to recreate this. So href is an attribute. Let me just. Write it like Can you this. remind me what an attribute is? Uh, on. Sorry? Can you remind me what an attribute is? Yes, yeah, so attribute is basically a kind of um, like a like a param param on a parameter on a HTML tag that will somehow instruct the tag what to do. Okay, so you are basically it's almost like metadata almost. You adding you adding kind of options and metadata to, to attacks and and then you can you can do something with them so this is this is our html tag this is the name of the tag which is a anchor and then you have a list of attributes you have href and id you okay. have the content of it and then you close it right so so this is the kind of how sorry ricardo no 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 sorry yeah yeah, yeah so this is this is this is the kind of autonomy of Anatomy of a, of a tag. I will show you in a, in a minute how we can how we can do this. and ID at the at the same level, kind of. They are attributes and they are yes, they are attributes. Yeah. About them at the same. Yes. Oh, oh, right. You can you can have for example class in here. Yeah. Then um, like um, anchors can have title for example. Right and and things like that. So so you you just list whatever attributes you have. Again, if you want to know and and this is good. If you want to know what um, attributes are actually supported on on a particular element, then you can go to documentation. I I recommend uh, MDN, and then in here you will see there is a list of all the attributes that are supported on the. Um, On, on the element, so you can you can actually find them in here. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. So now let's just add console in here. All right. So now. When we refresh the page, we should see uh, in the, in the log our element. So let me just go here, refresh the page. All right. So you see, like this is we selected the element. So now we know what we actually working with. Right. So from the whole page, you want to target something. You can use there is a there is a whole bunch of functions that you can use to actually select you can you can do get get element by ID get element by class query selector there are many different ways to select element but bottom line is if you want to interact with one element you need to be able to select it somehow that's why that's why also we have IDs and classes so so you know you don't have to say I want to select third uh, anchor on the page or something like that you can actually give it like a, um, a unique name and then select it that way um, so now that we have our element, we can add a listener to it, which we did in here. So we're adding on click, right? And we can say that on click, it will say hello in a in an alert. Okay. Now let's see if this is going to work because I'm not 100% sure. So if you click, you see hello, 
right? So, so you added basically some kind of interaction to that element, and then you go, okay, it will navigate you. So at this point, as you can see, it actually has two listeners, right, if you think about it. So we have added one, but there is still the default one. So default one is to navigate to different page, okay? So when you, when you click on it, the browser already has kind of a list of all the listeners that are listening for the click on this element, and it will execute them in the order as they were added. So we have added this one last, so it will execute this one, so hello, and then it goes next and it goes um, to the next page, which is the default one from the browser. Okay, so does this make sense, how you add the listener? Yeah. Now, if you look at, if I click here, I'm clicking, I know you can't see it, but I'm clicking on, on here and nothing is happening, right? That's because the event listener is only on the uh, anchor tag. If I change this and I say, um, and I actually add the event listener to the whole document, then whenever I click, hopefully, you see, it will always bring up the alert, no matter where I click. Okay, so you can assign the you can assign the events to anything on the page, whatever you can think of. We have body in here, so we can assign it to body or or anything else. So, in that sense, you can, if you look at here in in elements, I don't know if you if you are uh, kind of familiar with the console yet, but if you look at elements, it will show you basically the whole DOM tree of your. Uh, of your application. So anything that you see in here, you can select and you can add um, events to it if you want to. Okay. Right. What do you have here? Oh, so actually, let's go a little bit further and then we will recreate the, the anchor. So this is adding of, of uh, event. Um, yeah, so this is basically what we did with the with the anchor. Let's do it with button as well. So we have it with button. So again, we do button. Sorry. All right, and we'll see quickly. So we added button to the page. Click me. So we have anchor and we have button now. We can add it another ID, so we can target it, and then in here we can say uh, we can select it. So document get phone number by ID, and I am I am using um, get element by ID, which is something that you would normally not use but is just the sim is just the simplest right now the reason for that is um, IDs should be always unique okay like there's there should be always just one element on the page with the same ID the the browser is not gonna fail if you if you put multiple uh, elements with the same ID but it's it's not gonna be if you run it through like checks for for your uh, for your HTML it will scream at you that, that you have some errors in there uh, so basically it becomes a nightmare to manage them right to maintain them so if you have a if you imagine that you have a page that has like thousands lines of code or you have page that is split into hundred different files it's gonna be very hard to actually think about what uh, you know IDs you already used or not so um, that's that's kind of main reason why you don't use them uh, the main purpose of IDs are either unique identifiers, which is which is ID, right? So if you really really know that something is going to be unique, and also if you put something in in ID, then you can target it with a hash. So if you write in your in your um, URL, if you write hello world, it will when you actually load that page, it will scroll to that element. Okay, so that that's the kind of two main purposes of ID. Um, but normally you wouldn't you wouldn't you, you wouldn't you normally you would just say class, for example, and you would say hello world and class, click me, right? But there are disadvantages to do it in, in um, JavaScript because then I would have to say get elements by class, by class name, sorry, and it would select these, but then it could have multiple, so you would have to say, okay, I want only the first one, 
and that has some kind of disadvantages as well. So, so there is a trade-off for, for any kind of approach that you do. Uh, I'm choosing to use ID just because we're doing very simple stuff right now and, and it's just going to be much easier to, to see what we're actually doing. And what's the difference between get element ID by ID and, and uh, query selector? Uh, que so query selector is kind of um, it's kind of like an ultimate tool to select stuff because if you want to select something by ID you need to use this one if you want to use something by class you need to use uh, document get element by class name right so so you have different API if you if you don't want to use these functions you can just say document document uh, query selector you can do one or all and in here you can select it as you would normally do with uh, with your CSS so for example you would instead of hello world you would do hash hello world right so so you're actually saying the, telling the query selector that I'm, I'm you know choose I'm, I'm uh, targeting something by hash which is ID hello world if you would want to do it by class you would have to do dot hello world so this is kind of check of all trades, you would use this quite a lot only because it became very popular because of some libraries. I don't know if you've heard about jQuery yet. Well, not, yet in, not yet in the class, but Thomas, sorry to interrupt, yeah. since you are there, how do you actually address uh, an attribute of a class? Because for a class we use a dot, for an ID we use a hash, for an yeah. element we use an element. What about addressing an attribute? Well, you can do attribute as well. But yeah, so for example, you could do you can do data ID, for example, right? And in here, you could say I'm selecting something by, and then you would have to put it in the square brackets, and you would say data ID equals something. Okay, and how yeah. do I validate? Because in that parentheses, I mean that line three that you're working on. Are you actually validating that the data ID is equal to whatever you were going to put before? Uh, what do you mean that you're validating? Okay, let's 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 go back. Let's go back to uh, yeah there. Yeah. At, at the end of the square bracket, write down equals blah. Yeah. So are you gonna get a true or false in there because you are asking if it's you are making it the boolean from data equal blah or you are just assigning blah no this is um so this is not actually you you thinking javascript but this is not actually javascript right so this is this equal in here is actually what is that's run through it's, it's run it's run through css engine and and that's you just you just use sim, uh, single uh, equal they don't have any like equal equal or something like that it's just equal so is it validating? No, it's not valid. Well, it's it's validating. It will go through the page and it will check. You know, I want to I want to select um, elements with this value in data ID. Okay, so it's already bringing whatever, whichever match the data ID was black. Yeah, whatever you whatever you match in here. Yeah. Okay, because that's exactly what I'm stalking one of the exercises that I'm doing. Oh, in the exercise, that's exactly what we, I mean, that's what I wrote, it's like, okay, that data community name and then equals coders in boot, and you put everything in your bracket and it should work. Yeah. And you said that you made a for loop in there, Thomas? Sorry? Uh, no, the, the next one. Oh. Okay. We have a look okay. at you know, the siblings one, the one exercise 12, where I... I oh, okay, 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 I'll get there, hopefully today. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's not. Nice. The exercise is going to take quite a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I imagine they will get more and more complex as you go. Oh my god. <laughs> but, <laughs> welcome to our world. Um, yeah, so you can target it by you can target it by uh, our, uh, attribute as well, but it, you kind of try to avoid that. And if you would do that, you would probably do it with combination. So you would say, um, uh, you would say, query select all, and then you would say uh, an anchor element, which has it attribute data ID that equals something, something, right? Um, sorry, I think I wrote it 
wrong before. Um, so you usually do it. You usually do it with combination of like, okay, I want all the anchors with that selector, or or you can even do uh, hello world, right? So you can you can do I want to get all the class names hello world that has the attribute uh, data ID something something. So you can do whatever combinations you can do in CSS basically. Um, and that, that would be the syntax. Just go like hello world, you know, and then just under under brackets the uh, yeah. Actually, I haven't done this for a while, so let me just let me no, just no, no try. Worries. But I think and, it is yeah. And you so you prefer to go with get element by ID rather than that query selector. Um, it really depends on application. Usually, nowadays you don't really use these functions too much uh, okay. because you use kind of different approaches, but you still get to use these every now and then. Um, but normally you would go, you would go with probably the query selector only because it's easier to understand. You don't have to think about like you know if you change, if you change the ID to a class, then you don't have to change basically the signature of this. You would just change something in here. So so um, yeah. It's the easy option. Like yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of like catch all thing. It yeah. it became very popular because of jQuery, which is a library, and in jQuery basically how you select elements is you just do something like this, right? So you do hello world. So, uh, yeah, so this is what you do with jQuery or you can do, you can do something like this, right? Yeah. So, so because of this, everybody's using this now. Um, I actually think that this might have been before this one, um, but I'm not hundred percent sure about it now. Let me just see if, if we have this. <clears throat> God, it caught me off guard a little bit here because I haven't. I know, sorry, I didn't mean to. I just no, no, no that's that's. Didn't really understand why we? Because in our exercise we kind of learned the two, and I I just didn't understand the, the fundamental difference. But now now I, I get it. That's that's good. That's what I need to be caught off guard. Uh, oh, it's ID, is it? Huh? Hmm. Right, you see, now I got now I got stuck. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm I'm not gonna get stuck on this, but um, I'm pretty sure it's this. It's the syntax is like this. I'm, um, I would have to have a look at it later, but it's not selecting it basically. But I I will I will have a look at it later, and I will and I will comment on Slack because I haven't done this actually for quite quite a long time. Um, anyway, let's move on from this. Um, so yes, so we have button. Uh, we can add event listener to, to it as well. On click. Oh, sorry. And you can say alert. Clicked. Okay, so now if we click on hello world, it will say hello, it will go somewhere else. If we click on a button, it will say clicked. So you see, you can add as many as, as many event listeners as you want. You can add um, event, multiple event listeners to the same um, element. So if I add another element, so you see I, I'm adding second sorry event to the to the same element so if I go click and then click second right so you can basically do what whatever whatever you can think of with this uh, it's just a way to interact with the, with the elements what do we have here is that does it does it make sense so far yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So are you the one who upload the class after it's uh, recorded, or is it uh, Vasil? Uh, I I will be uploading it, but I'm just uploading it, and then he he needs to edit it somehow or something. Okay, because it's going to be very helpful for what we're working on. Okay. Yeah, it will be there. I I I tend to upload it either tonight or tomorrow morning, depending on time, but it should be there uh, by tomorrow. Um, right. 
I guess the the, the trick on the event uh-huh. is to get familiar with all the possible functions that enables the events, right? Yes. So you need to know what tools you have at your disposal, basically. Yeah, so, I mean, look, the events are actually quite simple, right? So if let me just remove all this because I think it might be a little bit confusing, right? So let's just let's just go with this, right? So we are back to basic where we have one element we selected somehow from the page. Let me just go and remove this as well. And actually, let's just put this back here. Yeah. So you have element on the page, then you select it in JavaScript. So at this point, the anchor is the element object, right? I will just show you quickly what it is. You might have seen this already. Yeah. So if you if you have a if you have a look at it, this is your element object, right? And it has all the information that basically everything you need to. You can change styles, anything. You can even remove it from the page if you want to. Now, this is basically everything that event is, right? So you, all that event is, is some kind of name of the event and anything that you want to do when that event is triggered or raised or, or fired. So on, the, on a kind of basic level, that's all you need to know. There is no, I, you know, people tend to overcomplicate it a little bit. And it's only because of all the kind of infinite possibilities what you can do with the events. But on the on a kind of like if you really strip it down, this is what it is. You just react to a name of event. So you're listening to this name of the event and you're doing something. It doesn't matter what is in here, this is all you, right? Like th- there's nothing to do uh, to kind of satisfy the browser or anything like that. It's all 100% whatever you want it to do, okay? So that's what it is. There's no, um, there's no kind of hidden gotchas in this. There are some things that, you, that, that you know, like for example, if you want to cancel uh, the default event or something like that. So you can do some things, but kind of on a basic level, and you know, Anchor might not have been the best example. Let's do, let's do button because Anchor will have the navigation. So now we have button, that's a hello world, we still have this one. And by default, this button is not gonna do anything, right? If I, if I comment out this, then this button, you're gonna be clicking it, it does nothing, okay? So it's basically blank slate for you to do something with this button. You target it, you, you get it from the page, and then you add a listener and you say, I want something to happen on click. You can also say, I want something to happen on hover, which means when I when I point uh, at the element. All right. So if I if I oh, oh sorry, this must be on mouse over. Yeah, so you see, like I, I point at the element, and it will show me that I'm hovering over it. So you can you can you can do whatever you want with the element, but whatever event you add, it will always have the same signature. You will add a listener. You will say what um, is the event that you want to listen for, and then you will say what it wants to do, right? That, so that's that's it. There is nothing. There are no other complications on or if you get stuck then it's very likely either because you misspelled the event so the event doesn't actually exist or that something is wrong with your logic in your callback there is nothing else that could go wrong in here okay so it's very 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 kind of simple thing uh, um, like a basic thing but it will get complicated because of the work that you're doing in here right like so you will you will normally you would want something quite substantial happen on click. For example, if you want this button to submit a form, you will register a, a click event. You can do it other ways, but let's say you register a click event. And then on the click, you would have to collect all the information from the from the form. Then you would have to validate them, for example. Then you would have to send them to the server. 
listen for the response and so on and so on and so on. So this this work in here could be quite complex, but it always starts with a single point where you just say, I want something to happen when this event is triggered. Does that make sense? Yes, should I, should I guess, should I uh, assume that in that example, for example, like for validating a form, mm -hmm. there's already there, there's a lot of uh, libraries available for it. I mean, obviously, we can probably just build a web on, but I'm guessing for those sort of things, you can rely on libraries yes. that somebody has already put it, right? Yes, there's a lot of libraries out there. I would say be careful with it, especially for form, since we're talking about it. Form libraries, they, they are, um, there's quite a mess in them, and, and forms usually are one of those things that almost every website has behaving slightly differently right so some website when you click in the field you want the label to fly somewhere or something like that when you submit it you want only two fields to validate but not the third one or you want to validate when you actually leave the field instead of when you submit and so on and so on and so on and every library will kind of cater for the problem that that developer had right there are some libraries that are really large that try to solve every single problem but then usually you will find like down the line that they might be doing something um, slightly differently that just doesn't cater for your example so specifically for forms I have to say that let's say out of 10 times usually like seven times you end up writing something on your own because forms are a bit tricky but Yes, um, whatever work you do in here, which is the more kind of logic of the application and stuff, there is very likely some kind of library for it. There are libraries even to simplify this, right? So if you don't want to, if you want, if you don't want to um, register the, the events this way, there will be some libraries that will do it differently. Um, there, there are libraries literally for everything. It's just up to you to decide if you want to use them. Um, at this point, I would say try to always write it yourself before you writing before you using library. But that's for this course, obviously. If you if you actually have some production stuff that you want to get out quickly, or or that you want to make sure that it's solid, then yeah, maybe you will use a library. It depends on the use case. Okay. Right. So. Um, so this is, do you understand how, like, what, what we're actually doing here with the at event listener and, and, and yeah. how to do it and what is the signature of that? Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like it should be more complex? No. Or do you feel like, you know, there will be always something that you will get stuck on or something like that? <laughs> no, but as you said, I guess there must be, if you click on it and then it creates like a, a column of different possibilities, um, like a nice moving little thing. I guess you, I mean, as you say, like the the alert hello can be just a more complex. Um, yeah, yeah, like, like lots of different functions that do different things. Yeah, and yeah. look, you're gonna be doing, you're gonna be working on on some very easy stuff, and you're gonna be working on some super complex stuff for for these kind of interactions. But today, just for the events, it will always start here, right? Like whatever, whatever you have in, in here, yes, it can get com as complex as, as, as it can, um, but it will always start in here. And there is not much that can go wrong in here, basically, because it's always a name and what happens when that is triggered. Um, that, that being said, obviously, there, there could be cases where you want to listen for the event and then Maybe after some time or after some some kind of other interaction or, or some situation, you want to stop listening for that event. So there, you can remove the event listener. I think we will get to it very quickly now. Um, can you use that? Uh, um, sorry if I'm being naive or whatever, yeah. but you actually uh, see what people actually do on your website. Like for example, I have a website and I want to see where people click when they come on the website. Yes. So there are. are Event listeners to actually kind of track whatever people do. Yeah, so there are uh, there are actually a huge services to do just that, right? So so for example, even Google Analytics has a little bit something like that. But there are other. I think if I remember, there is Lucky Orange, is it called? So there are there are so many uh, services that will that will let you do just that. So you go to this service. <clears throat> And 
you basically sign up and they will give you this little piece of code. And what it does, it you put that code in your page and they will set up listeners for everything. And then that listener, every time it's triggered, it will send something to their server. And then you go to their website, look at look at your dashboard and they will tell you, you know, uh, 50,000 people clicked on this button and, you know, 200 people scrolled all the way to 75% of the page or something like that. There are very sophisticated services just for that. And you can know what this person is, so like where they're from and... Um, not as much. I mean, you can see something from your from the user agent, from the browser. You can get some information mainly about the platform that they're using and, and the location is kind of tricky because if they use VPN or anything like that or, or if they, you know, like, for example, if I am in the UK but I'm using like a, you know, French computer or whatever, then it's kind of it's not reliable. But yeah, okay. but, but yeah, yeah, you can you can they, they will give you some kind of information. You can see in here they have some kind of map. Uh, they will give you information, but it's not reliable. that reliable, especially for a pages that don't have too many visitors. For example, if you have million visitors, then you can kind of be confident. Okay, this this data would like you know make sense. If you have a hundred visitors, you you know they will be all over the place. Like you know, they, you will get people visiting you from Australia or something like that. that you, you have no idea why, and, and you know it's just because they have VPN or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so so the user agent on the browser is not hundred percent reliable. Um, but yeah, so yes, there are pro pro products that basically lets you listen for everything, and then and then they process the data and show you some kind of uh, some kind of dashboard but again what they do is literally they will just say they will just say here document add 11 listen on click right and then they will say send to server for example and that's all they do right so so they will they will listen for everything so if i can say console log uh, user just clicked right and then To save it. So you see, like wherever I click, I will get that in the console, and you can. Can I? Can I oh yeah. So basically, you could recreate that yourself. Uh, yeah, it's 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 quite complex, but yeah, you can. Right. Yeah. Um, you can do you can do other things. So you can say document. Um, I think it's mouse move. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think it is. You see? So as I move my mouse, even by one pixel, it will trigger these events. Wow. Right. And these are these are quite like for example, mouse move is quite useful when you're dragging things around the page. Right? This doesn't always have to be for tracking, but it can be, you know, for like a visual stuff. But yeah, any any kind of event that you register, you will get. And this is basically what they do. And then in here in this function, we usually what they would do is they would get the coordinates where your mouse is, so then they can create something called heat map. Wow, okay. Right, so... My, question, my next question, if it's yeah. possible to do. So, for example, you, you can get this kind of stuff, so if you, if you, you know, sign up for their, like Hotjar is one of the things. If you sign up for their website, they will, sh they will show you kind of like a heat map of, um, you know, where the users kind of move their mouse and, and what, what they interacted with and stuff like that. So there is a lot of sophisticated pieces of software, and it's all based just on the events, right? Events are everything. If you don't have events on your page, the page is static. You you, do, you cannot click on anything. You don't listen for the user basically what they're doing. Events will enable you to do all that. Okay. Um, so now, how do we get um, how do we get the information from it? So it's nice that we get the click. Oh, actually, let me just I'm kind of derailing from the slides so let me just check what we have in here all right so yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about so uh, let's do input let's put input in here have you done any inputs yet um no uh, i don't think so Thank you. 
So again, I will I will get the um, I will target the element. So now I know that it exists. Right, so I have this input, and I know that I have it in here, and then I can say. Um, so for example, I want to always know when user changes a value. So if I do input at event listener, and I want to know when user changes something, so when, when the value inside of the input changes, then I can do that. So if I now start writing something, See, the value has changed right now this is this is this change is being triggered every event has some kind of rules when does it trigger the change particular one it it triggers on when you change something and then you click away from the field so when you actually focus away from the field that means that the value is committed to the to the input so you can actually see it in here let me just mute this one for now so if you if I show you, you see nothing in the console. If I say hello, nothing in the console. I go away from the field and it will tell you the value is changed. Now at this point, we don't actually know what the value is, right? And there are different ways how to get it. You could, one of the things is you could do input the value, which basically takes, again, input the value should give you the, the, the current value of the input. See, value, value changed to, to hello. So it will give you the, the input. This is not necessarily the best way to do it because you could run into some kind of asynchronous issues. So what, what you would normally do is when you subscribe to, a, to, to an event, the param that will be passed to your callback is the actual event that happened. Okay, so you can, this, this parameter in the callback of your uh, of your listener is everything about everything you need to know about the event. So if you print it out, you will see there's loads of stuff in there. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand that. So when you subscribe to, a, to an event, you, you give it the name and then the callback what should happen, right? And that callback yeah. is going to be executed with the details of the event. What actually happened? So, for example, would be the the name you put in. So, what would be the details? Yes. So, the details. If you if you look here in the console, this is everything that the browser will give you about the event. This is all the information that you will get from the event. Okay. And then from there, this is. This is the most reliable thing for event listeners because it happens on the actual event when it's triggered. Right? So it actually happens there, so you know that you have this. And then you can go from there and you can check, for example, target is the actual target of the element uh, of, the, of the event when it was triggered. Right? So you, you have all this information about the target as well. One of them is going to be value, if you look at here. You see, it's it's a value. So instead of getting it from the input, you can say event dot target dot value, and you will actually get the the value of what what changed. Yeah. And if you hadn't put anything in in line ten, like if you didn't put event, then you wouldn't then you you just wouldn't have this. But would it still work if you just put target dot value? No, because the tar because if you delete this, then you you don't have target. Target is not not is not there at the moment. Uh, yeah. Um, Thomas, yes. why didn't uh, this main JS, for example, file? Mm -hmm. uh, we can create with index HTML and CSS um, inputs and button. What the what the difference? You can create in CSS. You can create styling, but you wouldn't create an event listeners. I mean, there are some some um, there are some things in CSS how you can actually 
kind of react to some of the events. So for example, I'm sure that you know already from CSS you can do something like uh, if I would say name, oh sorry, hello world, hello world hover, for example, then this would change the styling on hover. So when you when you actually hover over the button, it would change the styling. So let me just show you quickly. Um, Right, so you see like if I did this with CSS, no JavaScript, just CSS, if I hover over the button, it will change it will change into red color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can react you can react to some of the events in CSS as well. But CSS will not allow you to do any logic, right? Mm -hmm. So so you can't in here you cannot say, you know, uh, like like the alert that we were doing, you can't you can't say that in here because CSS is just for styling. You can do it in JavaScript, but not in CSS. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, CSS is really just to 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 define how the things look. Again, they are blurring the the lines for some reason, where they give you more and more power in CSS that you can actually, you know, change stuff when you have different orientation or something like that. Basically, trying to help people to use less JavaScript and more CSS because it's potentially more performant, but um, they, you know, there is no way to actually implement logic in CSS at the moment. You can only change stuff, you can, you know, they can only react to some kind of things, but they can't actually run logic. Um, for example, I will show you what you can do with, with CSS, for example, so if I say I have a counter in here, and it's zero, and then I will say, on the but on the button, when you click on it, I want to increase the counter, and I will and I want to show it. Right, so clicked. Um, what is it? Okay, so if I go now in here and click on the button, it will. It didn't work. Right, let's just do this thing. <clears throat> so if I click clicked one time, if I click again, click two times. So you mm -hmm. see, so you're implementing logic basically into the web website. You can't do this in, in styles. You, you can define what should happen. So you can say um, when you click the button, so for example in this case you would say when it's active, that means when you're actually clicking on it, you want the background to be green. Okay, so oh, actually let's put it around so it's a little bit more... Uh, yeah, so in this case you hover, it's green, you click, it's red, you see, and then when you actually release the click, it will show you the event and it will say you clicked it one time. And again, it's green, you click it, it's red, and now two times. So you can, in CSS, you can do things like this. You can change backgrounds, you can move the button around if you want to. You can do some, some kind of stuff, but you can't really implement a logic into your, into your application, let's say, into your website. You can do that only in, in JavaScript. But frontenders, they they are using uh, CSS and HTML. How common they are using this? Uh, well, frontenders are using JavaScript as well. CSS, HTML, and, and JavaScript. They those those three are needed for anything on frontend. Mm -hmm. You will you can create static websites just with CSS and HTML, but it will be just static. There will be no interactions or anything like that. If you want something. Uh, to happen on the website, you will have to use JavaScript at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 
we have this logic. Uh, yeah, so for the input, again, you can get the value from, from event. So event is basically an object with all sorts of information about when the event happened. Inside of it, you can find target, which is the which is the snapshot of the HTML element that actually uh, triggered the, the, the event. Uh, well, that actually was target of the event and the value. So just to show you uh, what I mean by that. So if I, if I now do this, right? So document at event listener, click, oh, actually, let's just And is the event actually something from JavaScript in the sense that you are passing it there as an argument, but it already contains the target. Uh, property. Yes. So what you are passing is just not a random argument. It's just something that actually exists in the in the JavaScript uh, ecosystem, right? Uh, yes, kind of. the The thing is, you're not actually passing it in here. You're defining new function. Maybe maybe this will be a little bit. It doesn't really matter which way you write it. Um, so you're actually defining new function. You're saying this function accepts this this param. So when the when the um, event actually happens, JavaScript will call this function and it will pass the param in. Yeah, but that param is not just a param, it actually means something. If you put in there Thomas instead of event, it won't work because you're actually using a piece of code in JavaScript that is called event. No, you can you can you can name it anything you want. If you say Thomas in here, it will be it will be the same thing. It's just the first param to your callback is passed as an event. And then the target uh, is, is, is a property of Thomas, so Thomas doesn't really exist, and it has a, a, a property? Uh, Thomas Thomas is your local, uh, however you want to name your params locally, right? So, and target? So if I say, and the target is just inside of the whatever is passed into it. So if I write it out in here, so I say, this is my function, and I will say param foo bar. I say Wait, good. Oh, I see that all the time. Foo on, on yeah. <laughs> on uh, when I search online, I never understand what this is. It's it's just it's just uh, kind of like a random names that are that we get used to as a developers to use whenever we want whenever we don't want to like think of ah, proper names. <laughs> yeah, just a silly name. Okay. Yeah. So look, I'm defining my function. This is exactly what you're doing in here, okay? I'm defining my function and saying I have two params, foo and bar, and I will console log them. Now, what you do, how you call it, you just do example, uh, tar let's, let's do this, target, and it's some kind of object, right? So this is how you call the function. So you're not actually giving it any name when you call the function, but then locally you choose what the function, sh what what the name should be. So if I say if I define the uh, the the sorry the event beforehand, so I say event target something, let's say, then I can pass it in here as an event. Okay. So look, I'm not sure what. Oh, it's just uh, right. So yeah, but to Ricardo's point, like event seems to be something already built in because you have all this. Uh, it's an object with all these uh, different element types. Or yeah. So whenever whenever event is triggered, it will give you the object that that browser creates. Okay, so the browser, whenever you click on something or, or do any action, the browser is going to create one object and it will pass it into your into your uh, callback. But it doesn't doesn't if have you call it Thomas. If you call it Thomas, it would do the same thing. It will do the same thing. Yes, it doesn't matter. 
what you're doing in here is you're naming your local variable. It doesn't matter, like, what browser actually does, it passes an object in. It doesn't have any set name. It doesn't matter what the name is. All right, so, so if you forget about events altogether, and you just concentrate on what functions actually do, this is the example, so you would say, you can do this, right? So you say, my function will take two params, and locally, I will call them foo bar. And then when I actually call the function, I'm passing in example uh, event and number one, two, three, or let's just put it string so it's a little bit more obvious. Uh, one, two, three. So you as, a, you as the person who calls the function, you know that you're calling it example event and one, two, three, but you don't know what is it going to be called inside of when it's actually the function is executed because it's just locally named something. Does that make sense? Um, I, think, I think it does, yeah. The thing is, um, so if you look at the sub, um, so the dot target dot value, yeah. these would be kind of names you can't change, right? Yeah, because so anything, anything... By the web browser. Yes, so anything beyond this dot is already predefined and you need to know what they are. Yes. Yeah. So everything after this dot. So this is your local variable. You can name it whatever you want, and then any property of that is already predefined by whatever is being passed in. Okay. Does that make and sense? So whatever that event, so the Thomas or event yeah. is, it will always be an object with all the properties you showed us. Yes. And there is no other option, so you cannot have two parameters, or two parameters like Thomas and event, and then have something different actually. Than one. Well, it it depends on that depends on uh, documentation. So you need to find that in um, in the docs of of the actual browser. So if you look at the other event listener documentation, you will see that it takes uh, it takes type, which is the name of the event, and it takes the listener, and it will it will basically tell you what it gives you. So a listener is the, um, where is it? Ah, yeah, because maybe you want to have information yeah. on the person that actually is clicking and not on the click itself. Or no, you, or you would still have, you would still have, um, I mean, you don't, you don't receive information about the person. You receive information from the client about what happened. But it, like, you know, it doesn't matter who is actually doing it. It could be actually script that does it as well. Okay. So you do you receive some kind of um, information about what happened, but not not who is doing it. If that makes any sense. <laughs> Does it make sense, Ricardo? Yes, sir. It, I guess it just gets practice to see it working and get it done. Yeah, you need to. So we we kind of talking about two different things in here. So this thing, uh, when when you the confusion with the name of the of this is just basically how function works, right? So if you look at this, if you break it down, this is a function that you're declaring that does something, and it's basically just how function works. You just define your own local params, and then you work with them inside of the function. However, they are called when the function is actually executed, it doesn't matter. It can be something completely different, right? So this is, I think this is on the next slide as well, but I will just show you um, this can be taken out and put on its own, right? So I, I can say function event. Um, because the function is actually the event listener. Yeah. Added listener. So basically it's actually what, okay. No, I think I got it now. Right, and you can just pass it in. The first parameter should be something that the function expects, and then the second parameter is your callback, which is whatever you want to do whenever that expected event happens. Yes, so the first param is what... The first param is the name of the event, so what that's, that's what it expects, and then the second one, it will expect whatever should be executed after, um, after it actually happens, or when it happens. Okay. You can you can do you can do just this as well. 
but then obviously that doesn't do anything it just it just adds listen on click but it there's no like you know no benefit to this because you don't do anything after this right does that make sense yes yeah cool um so yeah so again you can you can strip out the function and you can put it outside and then you will see this it's just normal uh, javascript function basically and you can call it as as you know as you would normally call a function uh, in javascript right let me just see what else is in here um yes so yeah so you're getting the the value from the target uh, oh, I wanted to show you the different targets. So, look, if I do, let's go back to this. Actually, I think it's easier to read if you, if you write it this way. Man, we learned too much in so uh, few hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope it's not... If it's too confusing, then tell me, and we can just stop and talk more about something. Because I feel like, you know, I, I just know. want you to understand it. Otherwise, it, no, no, it's good. Uh, I was just kind of reflecting back on the past months, month and a half. <laughs> yeah, it's quite intense, isn't it? Right. So let's have a look at this. Um, so now I have this listener. But let me just get rid of this as well, and this as well. So I'm adding a listener to document on click, and I'm logging out the target. So what do you think that the we will see in the log? What do you think the target is going to be? If I click in here. Christina, Ricardo. I don't know, honestly. So the target from the event, it basically is telling you what you're clicking on. Okay. So if I click here, you will see that the target is the whole page. Is the is the HTML of the whole page. Okay. okay. If I click on the button, the target is button. Okay. Okay. If I click on the input, the target is input. Okay. Does that make so sense? Information from, from index HTML. Yeah, so yes, so what are you doing what we're doing in here is document at event listener click. So we're saying document is our element that we're interacting with. We are adding event listener to it. The event is click. Mm -hmm. Right? So we're saying document which is here basically this is th this whole thing yeah. uh, add event listener click to it so whenever you click on the document which in this case is everywhere right uh, execute this listener and this listener is saying take the event so basically what happened and show me what the target was of that event okay so again if i go here and i click somewhere completely outside of of any uh, ui then the target is the whole page. If I click on the button, the target is the button. If I click on input, target is input. But sorry, but still, my event listener is, is on the whole document. Okay? okay. And this is if we go back to what we what we what I showed you with the with the websites that basically collect all the data. This is what they do, right? So they will not when you put their code on your on your page, they won't they will not go through your whole page. And add listeners to everything. They will just add listeners to the whole document, and then when you click on something, the browser will tell them what you're clicking on. They don't need to know necessarily beforehand what you're clicking on. Okay. Okay. the the use The useful thing about this could be also uh, imagine that you would have a uh, hundred buttons in here. And so if I take this, I'm not going to do it hundred times. But if I if I take this and do a uh, many many buttons. I'm not sure why there is a bar. <laughs> right, so I have all these buttons in here. 
Once you actually need to worry about performance or just to make it a little bit cleaner in your code, you don't need to add 100 event listeners. You can just add one event listener for document or if you have some parent element on these buttons or something like that. And then when you click on them, it will show you the different buttons that you clicked on. So you will have one event listener for all the buttons and then you can use the target and from that decide, okay, I clicked on this button or that button. So, so, so what you would normally do is you would have buttons like this and you would have ID Hero World 1, ID Hero World 2, 3. This would be generated by some kind of script. You usually don't do this by hand, but for the, for the sake of this, let's just do this. Right? So we have 11 buttons. Okay. And now, if I click on this button, you will see that the ID is Hello World 1. If I click on this one, it's going to be Hello World 10. So you added one event listener on document, and you can see which button, you can decide which button has been clicked. So I can even do um, attribute. No, actually, let me just do cost name. Uh, I think it's just actually there. Um, I haven't done this for so long. Sorry. Let's just search this. For example, you don't remember. Can you go? Can you log the event and then you look at everything and you just? Yes, you can. It? Yeah. Just do this then. Right, so now if I click on here, it will, sh it will not show me anything. Why is it not showing me anything? Oh, because we don't have any class, do we? Yeah, we have ID, sorry. Right. Is it get, get the element by ID then? Uh, no, in, in here we already have the element. We just um, we just getting the attribute of ID, so we know actually which one it is. So I can now click on these uh, ah. buttons, and it will tell you which one it is. And from here, you can you, yeah, you can target them again. So and you don't even have to target them, but you know what the target is. So you can do anything with it, right? So you can say um, you know event target and then you can do let's say style uh, I don't know what, what can we do with it um, remove node maybe can do that why is it searching in Right, so we can just do remove. Yeah. Right, so so now if you click on a button, you will see that it's disappearing from the page. So you can, you know, by by actually using the target, you can remove it from the page or or do anything else with it. Basically. So the target is useful because not always when you when you when you get your callback on an on a event, it doesn't necessarily need to be the one, the element, the element that you actually subscribed on. It can be a different element. Okay, I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Um, and then we have, yeah, so we can, obviously we can, um, if we, if we, split this function out we can actually reuse it so let's say that we will have multiple inputs on the page and then we would do Uh, 
Right, and we would subscribe to to change on this. So we would say when whenever this input changes, then uh, console log or, or let's do alert and then target value. And we will do the same for input two and three. Okay, so now we have now we should have three inputs on the page, and whenever you change them, it will log out the value. I mean, it will alert the value of the whatever you put in. Okay, so now you see like this is a lot of repetition, right? So one way to change that would be you can take this function which is the same in in all the cases, and you can just say call, uh, you can just define it in here. I'll just define it like this and the input change and then you can just uh, pass it in here for all of them all right so you can you can simplify it like this so basically removing your duplications this is still duplicated, and, and you would handle it probably differently. As I showed you before, you could you could put uh, you could put, for example, form in here, and you can just register the uh, event listener on form instead of on each input. But for for the sake of this, let's just let's just leave it like this. So now each input is handling the change with the same function. Okay, so again, it works the same, Thomas. And so when you put the when you call the function in nine, eleven, and thirteen, mm -hmm. you don't need to to specify the event as a as a parameter because it's implied, right? You you already specified in here, yeah. You could also you could also do this. So this this is basically a shorthand for this. Short, uh, is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, um, why this is useful is because if you do a lot of kind of repetitive work, it's it's better to centralize it because if you want to change it, then you can. So, for example, if I want to say. Uh, if I want to add some prefix in here, so I say my name is yes. So then, if I put my name in there, it says my name is Thomas. My name is Kyle, for example. So. You know, I just changed the behavior of all the inputs by changing one line of code, and that's why we want to simplify it because you kind of you can evolve it. The same thing if, if I decide I don't want it to be alert, I want it to be console. I don't have to change it four three times. I can just change it once, and it will work. So. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So it will work uh, if you change it in just in one place. So it's it's nice to kind of extract the logic if you can somewhere outside. Um, any any questions on click or input events? Mm, no. No? Uh, not for me, thanks. So. Once you, right, so again, this is just example of another, oh, sorry, uh, uh, example of another um, event, which is submit. So if we have, a, if you actually have the form, so I added the form in here, you can add submit button. So we do, Uh, 
Bones. Right, so now we have form with, with three inputs in it and a button. So if I fill something in and I press this, it will actually submit it and you can see that it refreshed the page. Right, because that's the default behavior of the form. So just increase this a little bit. So it's what is this action and then method post? Uh, this is just another attributes of form. Uh, this is just basically telling the form where to submit the data and what is the method. The method is post. You will you will learn that probably at some point. I'm not sure if you, if it tells you anything, but it, it's okay. it's just another attributes of the of the form basically, telling the form what to do. Um, so if I do if I submit the name in here and if I submit it will refresh the page and it tries to it, it, it actually made a request to to index but obviously we're not handling it now so so that's another event so you can submit uh, you can sorry you can subscribe to another event on this form. Right, so if I do now and you can you can say by tag name as well. So you get the you, you get the form like this. Again, not recommended because if you have multiple forms on your page, then it's not gonna work properly. So probably better to just say name form and then you can have it something uh, a little bit more um, unique right so now we know now we actually targeted the whole form and we can say form at event listener and we'll be listening for submit of the form then alert submitting right so now before the form actually submits, I should be I should be seeing alert that it's submitting the form. So again, just another event, right? The the signature of this thing is exactly the same. You select the ele uh, element, and you add event listener to some kind of name, and you tell the browser what to do after that actually triggers. So again, exactly the same um, signature. Now, I think where we're going with this is. Yes, so the default behavior is what I told you before. If you click on link, it will navigate you somewhere else. If you click on, if you submit a form, it will collect all the data from the form and it will reload the page, right? So you see we lost all the data and reloaded the page and stuff. So uh, the one thing to prevent that, if you want to prevent that, would be you can use something called prevent default. So if I do prevent default in here, then it's not going to it's not going to actually submit. It's not going to actually reload the page. So it will show me that it's submitting, and it's oh sorry I didn't refresh. And it's not going to do anything. You see, it will just show me my uh, alert, but it doesn't do anything. So for example, for web applications, which is the kind of new way to write web 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 pages, basically. You don't really want to, when you submit a form, you don't want the user to go to another page that would tell them your form was submitted and then come back and, and stuff like that. You want, to, you want to show the interaction on the page. So what you would do is you would, you would say, I don't want this form to actually submit uh, as it normally does with the page reload. I want to prevent that. And then in here, you would manually somehow submit it to the server. And when I say somehow, it would probably be fetch, you know, server, something, and then the data, whatever, something like that. Yeah. So, so you would actually out like manually submit the data to the server in here. So in that case, the user wouldn't see reload of the page. It would just stay on the page. The data would be still there. The form wouldn't clear, and it would still be there. So that's how you can prevent. Uh, um, actually, the default behavior. Same for if I put the anchor in here, but as it was before. Mm. 
Yeah, so if I target it, So let's just do alert, clicked. So now what, what is it going to do if I click on that link? If I click on this link, what is it going to do? It's gonna add an alert saying clicked. Yeah, and anything else? They, it won't go to. Oh, where, where is where is link? What is your Google uh, link? Right here. Where is your Google? Link? Yeah. Okay. So it would it would go to Google then? Yeah. It will go to Google. Yeah. So if I click on this, you will see uh, alert, and then it goes to Google. Okay. If I add. No! 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 Oh. If I add this, what do you what do you think is going to happen now? Yeah. Christina, Ricardo, any opinions? No. Right. So if I click on the link now, I have this prevent default in here. So what basically that means, the default uh, the default behavior when it navigates a different page is now cancelled, right? With this line. So if I click on this, it doesn't take me to Google because I prevented the default behavior in here. So that's what this command is for. Um, just in case you want to handle it somehow differently. So you prevent the default behavior and the default behavior will be to go to Google. So that's what you're preventing. So you're preventing the default behavior from the event that you are applying, I mean from the from the HTML element that you're applying this event to. Yes. Yes. So the link is a is an anchor tag and the def default behavior on anchor tag on click is that it will take you to it will navigate you to the page that is specified in href. Okay. Okay. And because we're saying well on click we want to prevent it, that means it's not going to do it. Because your your uh, Event listeners are always above in the queue from the from the from the uh, default ones. So it will basically, as if you imagine it, uh, the browser triggers event, right, and then it goes listener one, listener two, and so on. So these are the user list. This this is the developer listeners that we add. And then you have browser default listener. Okay, so when you trigger, for example, for the link, when you trigger the event, you go through the trigger, and then you go one listener, second listener, how many they are, and then it goes all the way here, and by default, it will navigate to different page. If we add, if we add this kind of code where we prevent the default, it will go trigger the event, go to the first listener which is this one, and there is the first line in here is prevent default. And when, when it does that, it will not go here anymore because you prevented the default and it's not going to happen. Okay. So this useful, you don't, you don't use it for links as much, but for forms it's very useful because normally uh, you don't want user to navigate, when you submit a form, you don't want user to navigate a different page to actually submit the data and then come back. You want to, you want the submit to happen on the page without any refresh because refreshes are quite uh, expensive in a, in a time manner. So this is how, this is how you prevent the default. And again, this is just another, uh, another function on the event. So whenever you get the event back, you have this whole API that you can use to, to interact with the event, but it is actually happening right now. Um, yeah, so we did this. 
Any any questions about the submit listener for for forms? No. No. Okay. I think we do the uh, remove event listener. So I think this is the kind of last thing to know about list about the events really. So when you add uh, events to anything on the page, you can remove them as well. I mean, when you add listeners, you can remove them as well. So let's go back to just having a button. So now we're saying we are adding we are adding click event. So let's log something out. Again, the standard what we were doing before, you have a button, click it and it will show you in the console that you clicked it. Okay? Now you will have cases where you might want to listen for, for the events only to some point or only when something else is happening, for example. So we could do one one example we could do is we can create a counter in here, which is zero, and then we can say, well, I want to have I want to record only first ten clicks of the button, let's say five five clicks on of this button, and then I don't want to listen for the event anymore. So what you would do is you can start by the logic, so you can say counter plus plus. So you're increasing the counter and you you're actually checking. Uh, how many times you clicked it? So let's uh, let's log it out as well. So we have it here. Okay. So we are now. We should now see how many times you click, right? So clicked one, two, three, four, five, ten times. And now what we want is to add some kind of logic in here, where we say if the counter is more than five so you know first five clicks after first five clicks then and we want to say do not listen for this event anymore okay now obviously what one thing that you could do is you could just you could just put this in another if and say if the counter is less than five then lock something out which will work as well, right? So if if I if you do this, then you will see that you will log it five times, and then when you click, nothing happens. But just because nothing happens in the console doesn't mean that this this isn't running. This is still running. So on every click, you will you will get to this if, and you will you will evaluate all this all this stuff. So obviously, performance wise, is not great. So you want to actually remove the listeners. Let me just show you. Let's just do this, just to just to kind of make it a little bit more obvious. So if I click here, you will see that I have the pre-click and clicked how many times, and after five times, I will still get the pre-click, which is this one. So the event is still the listener is still running but we are not getting this information so this is not ideal because you're still running the whole listener which could be expensive so what you want to do is you want to say after five clicks i want to um, just unsubscribe from this event so i don't i don't execute this anymore so to do that you actually have to split this function out right so you, you would take this function out and you would say func uh, you would say uh, on click for example so now you know what the function is that you're actually subscribing to with your uh, with your listener listener and then you can actually um, remove the listener so you could say if if it's more than five 
then you would you would say uh, where is it button remove event listener on click and on click so in order to remove the event listener you need to know what the listener is right? because there could be many click uh, listeners so you need to know which one you're actually removing so now we should see on the page that you go pre-click one times pre-click three times you get to five. Oh, sorry six <laughs> because i said more than five uh six and then from there you don't get anything and you don't even get the pre-click right because this whole thing has been basically destroyed so this has been removed from the queue of the events and it's not gonna execute anymore okay so this is this is useful especially when you need to do something for example just once so you could say even without the counter if i simplify this a little bit you could say something like this so if you if you if you read through the lines is we we getting the button we are adding an event listener on click and the event listener executes this if you look at this function what it does it will log out that it clicked on the button and then it will remove the event listener which is the same uh, listener that we just created so this will tell you it will come here it will execute this and then it will remove the event listener so it's not going to listen anymore so if you click on it once you will get the click button if you click on it again you will not get it so this is useful this kind of stuff is useful when you want to execute things just once or a couple of times or while some kind of condition is uh, is true is it's that, interesting because it's yeah. actually the what we're doing is basically the function that we're running the button at the event listener has one parameter that has like a, a poison pill that actually removes but yeah. it's just yeah it's interesting yeah it's this this is a little bit confusing because you're kind of passing the function in to remove the listener it's a, it might be a little bit confusing, but basically what you're telling the browser is that this is my s signature of the function that I'm listening to, and I don't want to listen to this one. Because, again, the, the button could have 50 listeners on it on click. So the browser needs to know which one to actually remove. Right? So you need to pass it back in just so the browser can say, okay, find me this function in my queue and remove it from, the, from there. Is that is yep. is is this remove um, clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christina, were you going to say something? Yeah, but actually, mm -hmm. so if you need to remove something, it's just remove, and this is uh, this function is not remove all information, right? When you say remove all information, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, if you use, um, for example, word remove, yeah. I, I'm waiting to, to remove something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you're removing the event listener that you added in here. So this, you're removing from that. Right, so I would say if you, if you imagine it somehow, so if you look at what the browser has inside, the browser knows that there is a button. Right? And inside of the button, it knows that it has some kind of events. Ah. Inside of those events, there is click event. Right? And then inside of this, you have the listeners. And then inside of the listeners, you will have the default, which is you know, do something, whatever whatever it does uh, for the button. And you will have whatever we added. So we added on click. Okay, and for the, for the sake of argument, let's do another one. So button, add event listener, click. Okay, so now we have, and because we added it as an anonymous function, it would be basically an anonymous function. 
okay so this is this is what browser kind of you know what 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 is inside of the browser when, when it's running right so when you add the listener you basically adding something here into this list of the listeners of uh, the button you we added another one so we now have two now when this click actually happens it will come in here and it will execute this one right so it will execute this one and it will go actually you know what let me just put them like this right so when you click on the button it will first execute this anonymous function listener okay so it will go here this is our anonymous function because it doesn't have any name so it will come here and it will execute it okay it will log out hello world mm -hmm. then it will go next okay my next listener is on click it will go to on click and execute a uh, click button so you will see this in the console but also the next instruction is remove event listener from click and the, remove, the, the uh, event listener is on click. So literally what it does, it will say, okay, I am dealing with button. I want to do something with events. So we will go to events. Uh, I want to do something with click event. It will go to click events. Remove listener. That means I will go to listeners and I will take the listener that we gave it to find it in my list of listeners and delete it. So it will do this, right, when it, when it actually runs. And it will remove it from the list. And then it will go to default and it will continue. And then when you click again, it will go to back here and it will say, okay, this, here are my listeners for click, first anonymous function, and it will go, it will execute this, the next one default. There is no more record of this one because it has been removed. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, on this example, you can also see that there is no way to actually remove this listener, right? Because this is an anonymous function. If we do five of these, well, let's do just two of these. If you do two of these, you will have this in, in, the, in the queue of the listeners. And there is no way for the browser to identify which one to remove. Okay, so if you define your event listeners like this, that means they will always happen and you don't have any way to remove it. If you, if you actually want to remove the event listener at some point, you need to give it a name and you need to be able to pass it into the remove event listener function. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Everyone else? Yeah? Cool. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, we did this, this, this is the, this is basically just doing it once, so we, we did that. Um, and then there is this, um, so you can actually override the on-click and on-submit um, values of the elements, but that means you are, you, you will always have only one listener, right? So, uh, every element has um, has these events as on click, for example. You can define it like that. So you can say on click, do something. But doing this, and this is almost never done, doing this would mean that you basically overwrite all this. Right? You, just, you just get rid of all this and you just pass in one function. Um, why, it's never do, why it's never done? Because Obviously, once you get into bigger projects or even your own projects, doing this would mean that you, you potentially have unexpected behavior where all your other listeners will stop working and you don't know why. Or, you know, like if you use different library and the library adds some listeners to your code and then you use this and you basically remove all the listeners, then again, you will be, you will be wondering why, why, did, why did it happen. So this is almost never used. This could be used actually buy a library if, if the library is very invasive and it will tell you I will remove all the listeners on in your project and I will just use my listener you know then you could use that probably but it's very um, it's very kind of hardcore hardcore way of doing this so you almost never use that and you can again as you have uh, these names click submit and, and all, all of these you just do on click on submit on mouse move 
uh, and you can define it that way. Um, yeah, <laughs> pro is only 100 at a time, con only 100 at a time. Yeah. Mo in here it says sometimes you want multiple hand event handlers. I would say almost all the time you will want multiple event handlers. As as the application gets more um, complex, you will you will find that you know you, you might have a link with ten listeners on it or, or whatever or button especially. Um, yeah. Any questions about events? And please. If you don't understand anything, just let me know while we are here so I can try and explain it. I have a question, but it's not just about events, so I'm going to wait until we're done and uh, share a, a screenshot in here, but uh, sure. I have a question. Yeah, that's fine. Any any event questions? Events questions? No? Not from me, thank you. Thank you. Okay, it sounds like it's been a little bit confusing uh, lesson, but it, you, you know you will once you start using it more, you will you will get it. The more the most important thing is to understand callbacks because you know we saw that already. It it gets a little bit confusing with the event, and yeah. and a, another important thing to understand is that events are asynchronous, right? They are not synchronous. So basically, you in your code you do this. But nothing ha at this point, nothing happens. When I do, when I defy, de define these lines, nothing, absolutely nothing happens. It will save the listener for whenever the click actually happens. But at this point of time, nothing happens. So it's very much asynchronous coding because you basically telling the browser in the future when something happens, I want this to be executed. So, so once you understand that, it will be much easier to kind of uh, yeah play around with it. Right, Ricardo, what do you have for me? Well, since I cannot share a screenshot, a screenshot in here, I just I send you a code here in the chat. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, I'm running. That is one of the exercises that we have in the in in the course. And indeed, we do have. If you see the code, we have two items that are data dash community dash name equal colors in hood. Mm -hmm. However, when I run the test for it, the reason that it's not passing is because it's saying that uh, it's expecting to have two elements. And indeed we have two elements in there. So I'm not sure what else it's missing on that code. The community elements should have two elements. Do you have Do you have any? I, I would need to see the um, HTML for this because this looks sure. okay. Um, uh, if you have any Git, GitHub link or something like that. Well, oh, you know, you know what's wrong, um, Ricardo. Your what is coders in hoods is not spelled correctly. You you put com there in hoods. Ah. Huh. But then the code is, should be correct. So we should just. Switch coders to coders. You see, you see what I mean. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm running the test again, but if that is the case, then it is getting two elements. If you're not not the two that it expect. No, I'm still getting the same error message. So it's not a type. It was not because of the typo. And and the code, uh, Thomas is, is very short. Oh, sorry. I thought I was placing it there. Mm -hmm. but let me just put it there. It's weird because I did exactly the same, and I um, me it's passing. So coders in hoods. Ah, no, actually, uh, coders in hoods. So you need to add an S at the end of coder as well. Coders in okay. Yeah, coders in hoods. Yeah. Well, yeah, it passed this time, so it was the type of it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. But yeah, the, 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 the act labor is misleading because it's saying that it's expecting two elements, whether in this case it might be that the element were something uh, different. But yeah, that, that's a 
I had that's that's why I've been struggling with this, you know, like so many hours, like I was trying absolutely everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the case, trust me, it's usually the case. Good catch, good catch. Uh, thank you, Thomas, there with the cat, with the, with the type of, but yeah. yeah good uh, about events listener, well, like Thomas says, there's a lot of new things in here, a lot to learn, and basically we need to get to put our hands in the keyboard and get that uh, fingers memory that we're going to be getting after all these trial and error stuff. It's a lot of <laughs> time-consuming thing, but that's a way to learn yeah. it. So. In my in my opinion, trial and error is the best way to learn. That's how I learned anyway. Um, you know, it, it really is because the more you fail, the the, the better you get. <laughs> exactly. No, and I must say, all these exercises are quite. Uh, I mean, it's very time consuming, and that mm. that aspect of it, I'm not sure I like, but um, I quite enjoy um, learning by by doing and by yeah, same as Ricardo, like just. Trying to get like create get it right, like by just trying and error, spending hours on Google trying to find the <laughs> solution, and um, especially when you're kind of new, like for example, this foo thing, I kind of see it a lot, and I was like, yeah. not sure what, what what it was. Yeah, you will get used to it, don't worry. Um, to be honest, I have to say that you know the way the way that Russell has it set up with the tests is pretty good because at least you will see, you know, you you try to fit the test right, like. Some other courses, you they just give you the, the kind of assignment and they don't really, you don't have anywhere to verify if actually you're doing the right thing. So so with the testing, it does help a lot, I think. So that, that's, that's, that's really good what we did there. Yeah, I was yeah. telling, I was telling uh, Vasil about that because I've taken a lot of courses in my life mm. and really what you learn is when you get hands-on to do stuff and in programming particularly, uh, there's so many courses out there that is like do on your own, watch the videos, do your stuff, but yeah. you don't really get much out of them. Like I'm getting out of here, you know, like this continuous uh, mentoring while doing the code, it's a, a great combination and it's something very, very powerful that you guys have in there <laughs> as, a, as a community to for teaching. That's really good to hear, yeah. All right, Anyways, great. I got to you guys, so it was nice talking to you. Uh, I got somebody else uh, not waiting for me here. Okay. Of I'm here. Well, thank <laughs> you for coming. Um, yeah, guys, uh, if any other questions, shoot. Otherwise, uh, have a nice evening, and I will see you next time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you, guys. You. See you. Bye. Bye.